So machine control of construction is on the rise. It's inevitable that it will increase more in the future. This 3D printing process is fascinating, but is the result good enough? Can you use this method to make housing affordable and thermally efficient? This is an example of uh, one thermal standard in Germany, which is higher than the standards in the United States. Compared to that on the right is the passive house standard, which is several times more efficient in terms of minimizing heat loss. Can you build passive house with 3D printing? This is the only study I've found on heat loss in a 3D printed wall. This is the example of the wall that they used, which isn't typical, but it's better than a lot of them. A passive house wall is in the range of approaching R60 in insulation. Other examples of that are using TGI joists over the outside of the building or these pretty elaborate wooden trusses here that really minimize the thermal transfer through this exterior framing. This is a different way to do it where you can have uh, essentially a party wall so you don't get any thermal transfer from the studs. Here's an example of what it looks like in real life. This is uh, not even as good as either of those other two. This is actually where you're just using a double stud wall only. This is the ideal model for a dwelling where you have an interior structure that's completely isolated from the outside world and even the ground below it. This void would ideally be filled with a vacuum, so you have zero thermal transfer through it. That isn't practical, but the idea is to get as close to this as possible. This is what the, a 3D printed wall, at least with the start of it, looks like. So these layers are, are printed and it's usually in two widths or shells. This is the definition of a 3D printed wall according to AC509, which is the closest thing we have to a code right now for 3D printed walls. This would be in the International Building Code Acceptance Criteria. And part of this definition is highlighted and then placing a proprietary concrete core between the shells or widths to form a solid wall. That's part of the definition of what a 3D printed concrete wall is according to the code. So that would look like this, where you have solid concrete or a proprietary mix between the two widths. And it goes on to say that it's only good for seismic design categories A and B. So categories C and D cannot have 3D printed buildings. This is how a project in Arizona got around <clears throat> this. They did not want to put have solid concrete filling the void between these two widths on their exterior walls. So they've only printed in areas uh, and where they have columns and these column caps circled in red. These are like the heavy duty Simpson column caps that have a three quarter inch bolt, a couple of them that go in each beam. And since they couldn't use these walls structurally to carry the roof weight, then they put glue lamb beams all along the exterior wall and all along the exterior wall, and all along outside of here because they couldn't use the concrete. This can't be affordable. And it is also a big heat loss wherever these caps are. You have heat going through the steel and you have solid concrete below each one of these as well. This is a well thought out project, but a difficult one where they use instead of three widths, they use a width and then they use a column at the corners, which would carry all the way to the roof. And in this case, they wanna use a concrete roof. They have a precast sections that come in, but don't have all the concrete on them yet. And these are set down where they have to be designed to take the load only at the corners. So they have to have all this extra shear reinforcing in here to allow them to uh, take all this concrete weight at, at point loads. If the entire wall could be designed to carry the weight and not have thermal transmission, then these lids would be a lot less expensive. This project is one where the concrete 3D printed was only allowed to be one story, but then they did the second story on top with wood framing, which is kind of defeating the purpose because this is still two story loads going into this lower story that's printed concrete. And I just want to bring attention to these walls here. Either these walls are insulating or their shear walls that meet code, but they can't be, be both because it's only two widths that they printed here. 
So if these are actual shear walls that are taking the wind and seismic loads or whatever they may be in this direction, then they're filled with concrete and they don't have any insulation. Or they have insulation, but they aren't actually something with this design to take the shear loads. So the simplest way to build with 3D printed walls is to make a monolithic slab on grade and just start printing on it. And the idea is you can print these two widths and have some insulation in between them. One reality though, is that to connect the foundation and the wall together, you need to have some kind of anchorage. And generally that needs to be done by placing some rebar dowels into the concrete and casting some concrete in between the two widths and to anchor the home. So here you have a condition where you don't have thermal insulation coming out the bottom of the wall. So sometimes out of convenience, people will build an oversized slab um, so they don't have to define the outline of the building until they go to print it. And then you can just print all over the place with the top of the slab being the zero on the z-axis. One issue with this is that it, since it doesn't have drainage on the outside, it tends to collect water at the building and then water can seep underneath the wall and get on the inside of the building. And also thermally, you're, you're radiating heat out the slab and, and anywhere where you have some fill through the wall that isn't a good insulating material, it's going through the wall and out the edge of the slab. It can be better if you 3D print the walls over a footing and then subsequently place the slab. This way, whatever insulation value you get out of the wall can help protect the slab itself from heat loss. What often happens though, is that you need to make the anchorage here and the material you put in between these two widths to make connection to the concrete footing um, ends up being something that isn't very good insulation value. So your slab can still lose heat through this material. Concrete is not a very good insulator. It takes about 11 inches of normal concrete to make an R of only one in US Imperial units. So there's no way you can get good insulation out of a normal thickness concrete wall. Um, proprietary mixes, of course, can be better. To attach the top of a printed wall to a roof, most commonly people will pour a bond beam in between the printed widths in which to embed some anchors for the attachments of the roof members for wind uploads and things like that. At openings in the printed wall, it is necessary to support the printed material with some kind of element so that you can keep printing and create the opening. And I'm really surprised to see that some of the printing people have been using a steel plate for this purpose and leaving it in place um, because you're already having an issue with losing heat through all this conductive material, but steel is a really efficient conductor of heat. So the amount of heat loss through this plate going from the very inside environment to the very outside environment is excessive. So an obvious solution to this is to print three widths so you can devote one of the bays for structural concrete and another bay solely for insulation, except for whatever ties you need to tie the two widths together. Um, this has a disadvantage in more material usage and also the walls can get to be quite thick, um, approaching up to a half a meter in thickness. Um, I think this is the reason why they don't do this in the U.S. is because they're trying to bring material costs down. So to compare with other types of concrete construction for dwellings, um, this is an ICF wall, insulated concrete forms. We have our EPS forms set in place and all these form ties between them that allow them to take the form pressure of placing concrete between the EPS foam walls, widths actually. And they have also, they use the form ties as a substrate to connect uh, things to, like the drywall that has to go on the inside, and then on the outside, whatever cladding that, that you would use for them. This is a thermal representation of an ICF wall, where it's warm on the inside, cold on the outside, thermal mass here, and a layer of foam on each side of it. ICF construction is good quality construction. Why not make it better? Why not take this foam that's between you and the thermal mass, and so it's, it's hurting the effect, and move it over here on the other side of the thermal mass. So the thermal mass is inside the house doing the most good, and all the foam is outside the thermal mass where it's doing the most good. It's a win-win. The thickness of concrete in ICF is generally eight inches for purposes of consolidation. You have a tall wall with foam forms, so you can't use intensive vibrating. You tend to have a lot of congestion because you have plastic form ties and steel that can be a long way down there. So eight inches is the thickness that allows you to make sure you can get consolidation, don't get honeycombing down at the bottom of, the, of your 
concrete wall. But if you're placing concrete from the side with digital means, four inches is no problem. You can have a lot of steel congestion and you know that you're getting good consolidation and you just go up the wall because you can see it as you do it. It's a win-win-win. So if you want a thermally efficient wall, and particularly if you want to meet any passive house standard, the installation is the most important part of the wall. So if you're using foam, why not place the foam first before the concrete? The foam can be placed, put in place physically or it can be digitally placed. It can have pre-positioned ties so that when you place the concrete by 3D printing or other digital slip forming means, then the concrete is going to be automatically attached through to the ties through the foam to attach to the cladding on the outside. You can make the foam any thickness you want and it can help to define the concrete. You can have all the reinforcing in the wall you want and you can have all the rebar coming out the footing that you want. There's no interference issues. This allows you to build in any seismic zone and multi-story buildings basically as tall as you want. If the foam is in place first, it allows you to have a complete envelope protecting the thermal mass from the outside world. And in fact, you can envelop the entire footing so that the ground, the, the slab, outside the footing, outside the wall is completely isolating the thermal mass from the outside world. If you're using an open cell foam, it can also serve as your rain screen as long as you just flash underneath the foam all the way back to the concrete. And ideally you'd put a vapor barrier right there. So any moisture that gets in the wall from condensation or any other means will work its way down. And also that's a reason for the slope on the, the ties for the stucco that if they are intercepting any water, they'll tend to direct the water outward. But it, the last barrier is this flashing at the bottom of the wall that directs the water outside of the, the nosing at the bottom of the stucco. This same kind of flashing detail would be used at the window heads. So what's the point of this video? I think that if we're going to have machines controlling construction, then they should improve it. We should have, construction should be better in every way if we have machines doing it. And I think that's possible. And I'm trying to work towards those improvements myself. 